This podcast contains content not suitable for younger listeners. Listener discretion advised. For the last four years, I've spent every working day trying to figure out how to definitively prove that a murder was committed back in 1997. Or if you want to get technical about it, and apparently I do, that a car accident that happened in 1997 was not simply an accident. This search sometimes feels undignified on my part. I've had to ask about addiction, about fares, where, how often, with whom, about personal financial histories, about their relationships with their partners, their friends, their children. And I'm not a detective or a private investigator. I'm not even a crime reporter. But yes, every day for the past four years, I've tried to figure out the connection between a fatal car accident and the driver's supposed best friend. Before I get into why I've been doing this, I just want to point out something I'd never really thought about before I started working on this story. And that is, it's really hard to justify calling someone a murderer just because they're not a good person. I mean, just because someone isn't necessarily a good person doesn't automatically make them a murderer. But what about when it does? Think about the last time you acted in a vindictive, vengeful, or angry way. Did you yell at your kids or your siblings? Did you snap at another driver who forgot a turn signal? Have you ever lied to someone? Who was it? What did you say? Why did you do it? How could you be so deceitful? Now imagine that someone close to you turns up dead, and because people see you as evil or a bad person, you go to jail for the murder. No real evidence, no real proof, no real case, just guilty. Because that's the situation in the story I'm working on, in which a man went to jail for a crime he didn't commit. Have you ever been um, accused of something you didn't do? I have siblings, so literally, like, all the time. I got accused of stealing from the lunchroom once when I was, like, in second or third grade. I remember that happening. Didn't one of the boys tell the lunch lady you took a milk or something? It was iced tea. And yeah, it was DJ. He was the worst. Somebody called me out last year and talked bad about them. But it wasn't true. She wouldn't tell me who told her I'd said something. But it sucked. Why did it suck? Well, she was really angry about it and said horrible stuff to me that really hurt. So that part sucked. And then the fact that she thought, like, that I would ever say anything to hurt her, too. Like, she thought that I could betray her like that. I know. It's just crappy. I think we can all agree with Rick Yor. It feels crappy to be accused of a crime you didn't commit. But there's also another situation in this story, and that's the part in which a man didn't go to jail for a crime he possibly did commit. Here's the case I've been working on. Almost 25 years ago, on August 11th, 1997, Banco Allen was killed in a car accident on East Marcus Street in New York County, Pennsylvania. He was 34 years old, a widower, and a father to a son who survived the crash. He was intelligent and funny and a great athlete. He worked in his, as an accountant, and he was meticulous about everything. That day, he was supposed to take his son to Little League baseball practice and then to kindergarten orientation at Warwick Elementary. But on the way, two of the tires came off of the car, throwing the vehicle across three lanes right into oncoming traffic rolling and eventually wrapping around a telephone pole on the other side of the street. Banquo was killed on impact. His five-year-old son escaped with just minor injuries. Police ruled it an accident. About six months later, an anonymous source sent a letter to the local paper, the Daily Globe, suggesting that this was no accident. The paper published a letter which accused Banquo's childhood friend and local resident Mackenzie Stewart of sabotaging the vehicle to intentionally kill both Banquo and his son. Police addressed the letter in a press conference, but no investigation was opened and no arrests were made. Not for this death, anyway. So again, we are aware of the letter, we are aware of its contents, and we are comfortable dismissing the allegations as false. So, am I correct in saying that Mackenzie Stewart is not a suspect at this time? There are no suspects, because this was a tragic accident, nothing more. You don't find anything suspicious about the tires on the car? That seems like a normal traffic incident to you? Our team did not note anything suspicious about the scene of the accident, no. Officer Lennox, many local residents feel very strongly that this case needs to be investigated since the publication of this letter. Do you have a message for them? Do you plan to address those concerns? Our message is, again, that we are comfortable dismissing the allegations as false. That's Officer Lennox. He was the head of public relations for the York County Police at the time of the accident. He retired in 2002 and now lives in Verona Beach. We spoke over the phone about the interest in the accident. 
Yeah, it was a really crazy time for us. York had so many problems to address, and I guess people just thought, just thought, I don't know, that this was an explanation for what would otherwise be just horrible luck for the man driving. But you really don't think there is anything worth investigating? Listen, my job was to go out and, you know, talk to reporters and, you know, try and set everything straight. The media got crazy over the letter and we started getting all sorts of crazy calls and letters and threats and we just needed to try and cool everybody down. But right, I get that. I totally get that. But you didn't um, think that there was a chance something had been tampered with on the car? I'm not a mechanic. I just use what the boys report to me. And let me tell you, some real crazies came out too. People really think themselves detectives like they see on the TV and go out and try and solve something that we determined wasn't a crime. But people, I guess, just... Okay, but outside of you doing your job at the time, what do you think now? After seeing the evidence that's out there that these people have put together, do you not have any thoughts on it or... I do not, no. I guess anything is possible, but I just don't think so. I first heard about this story about four years ago when I got an email from a man named Flance Allen. Flance knows his case pretty well. He's the surviving son from the car accident in 1997, the one that killed his father and, he believes, was meant to kill him as well. Flance was writing to me because, way back when, I used to be a reporter for a widely read newspaper, and he'd come across some stories I'd written about a building collapse that had initially been dismissed as a tragic accident, but was later revealed to be a cover-up for a triple homicide. Flance told me he thought that his father's death was not just an accident, but a crime that had been overlooked by a struggling and bankrupt police department that didn't want to add another murder case to their long list of unsolved homicides and dead ends. Flance asked if I would please just take a look at the accident, try and prove that his father's friend, Mackenzie, was responsible. I don't get emails like this every day, so I thought, sure, why not? Okay, so when I was like five years old, my dad died. It was a car crash. I was there. He was taking me to baseball practice. Two tires came loose, and yeah. The media says it was an accident, but they don't have all the details. They think they do, but they don't. The problem with this case is that it is impossible to talk about the car accident without talking about another death that happened six years later. And in order to talk about the other death and the subsequent chaos that ensued, we have to start at the beginning. Here's what we know. Mackenzie Stewart, more commonly known as Mac at his own insistence, was born just outside of York, Pennsylvania in a town called Caldor on November 10th, 1962. His father died when he was less than a year old, and his mother, Susanna, supported their small family working as a secretary. When Mac was just about to start third grade, his mother remarried and the family moved into York and started him at Warwick Elementary School, where he met Bengwo Allen. Bengwo was a few months younger than Mac, but from what we can tell, he was the brighter and stronger of the two boys. He excelled in school and played several sports in junior high and high school, helping to secure Mac a spot on the football team using his influence as team captain and quarterback. Mac didn't have a very good season, and quit before the playoffs began. Both boys met Elizabeth Hathaway during their freshman year. Beth was bright and vivacious and had a bit of a wild streak, and she and Mac quickly hit it off and started dating. The three of them spent most of their free time together, working at the Y each summer, watching football in Mac's basement every Sunday, doing homework at the local library on afternoons when Bankwo didn't have football, track, or baseball practice, and Beth didn't have choir rehearsal. I spoke to one of their friends from high school, Ross Swarkey, Ross isn't sure what to believe about Bankwo's death, but he doesn't have the best opinion of Mac or even Beth. He was in Beth's homeroom and remembers when she and Mac started dating. It was super weird to me because she was so outgoing and all honors classes. He was just, you know, a brute, I guess. I was honestly shocked that he was so bad at football because he just always seemed like he wanted to beat someone up, like even over something as stupid as his name. His name is Mackenzie, but I guess he got teased for having a girl's name or something. So he'd freak out if all if people called him Mackenzie, would basically yell at them that he went by Mac. Beth was the only one I remember who, I guess, allowed to call him Mackenzie, but you could tell he didn't like it very much. But Beth got away with it, But and he seemed totally in love with her. She was in many clubs and activities and dragged him along, but he never seemed totally into it. I remember during our senior year, Beth was really into being prom queen and basically was campaigning for it, but I don't think Mac even wanted to go to prom. Like, someone else ended up winning, I'm pretty sure, and I knew it annoyed Beth because she felt like it was Mac's fault or something. I was friends with them, 
but I was mostly friends with Banquo and just hung out with the three of them because he was so close to both of them, I guess. Did you keep in touch with any of them after graduation? Yeah, Banquo and I went to college together and lived in the same dorm my freshman year. So when Beth and Mac would come up to visit, I would sometimes hang out with them in a small group, but uh, I don't know. I just always felt like something was off about them, you know? Like, <laughs> but maybe that was just because everything that's happened since, you know, with the accident, Beth's death, the trials, I, I just don't know what to believe. This was a common theme in a lot of conversations I had with their school friends, that most people were actually friends with Banquo, but Beth and Mac were sort of part of a package deal. A lot of people didn't know what to think, but everyone said it wasn't totally unbelievable that Mac was involved in both deaths. However, they all admitted that they weren't sure how much their opinions were influenced by all the information out there and the media frenzy surrounding him. It's Olivia, right? Hi, yes, hi. That's Olivia Santa Marco. She's another former friend of the group, but she was much closer with Beth during high school. They had several classes together and both were in choir. Olivia's in her 50s. She's short and petite with bright blonde curls that bounce every time she gestures to emphasize a point. She's adorable looking, but you definitely shouldn't mess with her. She's very smart and very tough, and has struggled with Beth's death for many years. Her daughter Liz is named for Beth. I mean, Beth mostly spent time with Mackenzie when we were in high school, which meant she was spending time with Banquo too, since they basically were always together. But when she wanted to spend time away from the guys, she and I would always hang out. I was probably her best female friend, and I think I knew her almost as well as Mac did. Better in some ways, but he was always her first priority. Would that bother you, or was that just part of your friendship? I mean, it didn't bother me that much, but we started to drift apart after they got married. It felt like she just pulled away from us, from all of us, and we didn't know why. But I always tried to look out for her. When she was first reported as missing, I was right there looking for her and making phone calls and posting online trying to find her and bring her home, and then... I think he did it. Sorry, I know he didn't do it or whatever they are saying now, but I just don't trust him. She changed after high school ended. In what way? Well, she could have gone to college. She was smart and could have gotten a scholarship if she had applied, but she just kept saying it was too expensive. I think she just didn't want to leave Mackenzie. She was always too good for him. When they all graduated in June of 1981, Banquo went to Stratford College to study finance, like his father and grandfather. Mac and Beth stayed home and found work, unable to afford tuition anywhere. Mac got a job at a local casino as a bartender, quickly working his way up to a shift supervisor. Beth worked part-time at a daycare and picked up weekend shifts at the hardware store in the town center. Banquo came home for holidays in the occasional weekend, and once every month or two, Mac and Beth would make the drive out to visit him and his girlfriend Judith for tailgates and frat parties. Banquo was the best man at Mac and Beth's wedding in 1984. Mac was the best man when Banquo married Judith in 1989. And when Flance was born two years later, Mac and Beth were named as his godparents. It was a perfect extended family, and the five of them spent holidays and weekends together until Judith was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1994 and died within the year. Beth and Mac took time off from work to help Banquo at home and with Flance, but the relationship between Banquo and Mac became strained and uncomfortable, and after a few months, it was just Beth who was going to the house. After some time, it seems that even she drifted away from Banquo and his son, and not soon after, the accident happened. Flans thinks that's because Mac was responsible for the accident. After my dad died, Mac couldn't look at me, like, at all. He'd catch a glance and just get really uncomfortable and awkward. He was sketchy, to say the least. Maybe a little paranoid, probably? I don't know. I think paranoid would probably be a good word for it. He seemed anxious that he'd get caught with something. He seemed guilty, but in a condescending way, if that makes sense. I don't remember him being comfortable around me after dad died. He never really went back to normal. There was always something that made him seem uncomfortable, and that thing was usually me. At the time, I felt at blame for his unease. I thought he couldn't look me in the eye because I took away his best friend. Now I know that he was the one to blame. Mac killed him. I really think he did. There's a motive. There's evidence. He did it. Now, I know the accident in Flans's request started this line of inquiry, but honestly, that's not what intrigued me the most about this story at first. What really interests me is Beth's death six years after the car accident. Not how she died, really, but the case against her husband when he was accused of her murder and brought to trial. See, it wasn't that there was overwhelming evidence tying Mac to her death. There wasn't. Or even a mistress lurking in the background to assign blame and cast a shadow over his innocence. 
there wasn't. The state really didn't have anything except character witnesses and a public pressure to convict. Remember that letter in the Daily Globe, the one suggesting the car accident was murder and that Mackenzie Stewart was to blame? That was part of the prosecution's argument that he was guilty of murdering Beth. That getting away with murder had given him a sense of power over the law. That he could outsmart the investigators. That he believed he would get away with it again. They pushed this narrative so much that it often seems from the court recordings that Mac was actually on trial for Ben Glow's death, and not the death of his wife. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the man you see in front of you is a murderer. In 1997, he sabotaged a car, resulting in the intentional death of his former friend, Banker Allen. That murder was overlooked by a police department that was overwhelmed with crime and corruption, a police department that didn't want another murder added to the long list of unsolved crimes. So yes, Mackenzie Stewart killed Banker Allen and is clearly capable of murder. He's capable of killing, so of course he is capable of killing his wife, Elizabeth Stewart. This man is a terrible and violent character. You will see throughout this trial that Mackenzie Stewart is a person with evil in his heart, a person who eliminates problems instead of working through them, a person who cares for no one but himself and caused the death of his wife. This is how they framed it. Look at what a liar he is. How duplicious. He plays the supportive husband, the loyal best friend, the dedicated godfather. But look at what he was involved with. Look at how evil he is. The letter was interesting. It's equal parts demanding and verbose, over-the-top ramblings, it reads. To whom it may concern, I am horrified to reveal such an atrocity. I can no longer prosper without divulging the knowledge that consumes me. However, I believe Mackenzie Stewart has certainly caused the tires of Banquo Allen's incredibly secure vehicle to be quite defective. His brain must have been submerged in an acid solution to stimulate him to take on exceedingly far bounds resulting in the untimely departure of a father's spirit, rendering an innocent child an orphan. Mackenzie is a perilous and unhinged man. This inconceivable action must not be perceived by those who are indifferent or unsympathetic. It must be perceived by those who have blood pumping hearts of passion. The precariousness of Mac's presence in society, I hope with this letter, will cease to plague us. Sincerely, Austin Bennett. The letter caused something of a scandal in York for several months after the paper chose to publish it. There was a period of time when Mac really couldn't leave the house, and even Beth was getting harassed at the grocery store, but it didn't last. Not on any large-scale level, anyway. There was still the occasional piece of hate mail that would end up in their mailbox, but other than that, most people slowly forgot the entire situation. That is, until Beth went missing. The speculation started almost immediately after police announced that they were beginning to search for her and escalated after her body was discovered almost two weeks later. Public pressure mounted quickly to arrest Mac, even before Beth's body was found, and police put their resources and time into investigating Mac, ignoring other leads and tips. In the late evening of November 13, 2003, Mac was arrested by York County detectives. He was at home washing the dishes after dinner when they showed up at his house. It took him straight from his kitchen sink to an interrogation room at Homicide in the city center. A few years later, Beth died. I think I was 12. Mac went to trial for her death. That messed me up for a really, really long time. It was like losing a mother, again. Beth basically was my mom. She took care of me, she was there for me. She just totally stepped up and beyond to make sure that I was taken care of. Even when my dad was alive and he got rough with his gambling or was having a bad day, or even when I just needed someone, Beth would always be there. My dad would probably call her before calling 911 in an emergency. She wouldn't leave until she knew I was okay. And she was what I needed, an alive, emotionally available parent. Matt got convicted in her case, and then he was released after an appeal. That's actually when I started thinking about the crash more like in-depth rather than this is low-key sketchy and then moving on. Mac was convicted for Beth's death. Yeah. And that doesn't satisfy you at all? No, it doesn't. I'll never get closure. He may have been rightfully convicted of Beth's death, but that would only be one of the two murders that he should have been convicted of. And he got out anyway. But the court hasn't and isn't going to help me. At, and at this point, I'm desperate. I want, I need to prove I'm right, which I know I am. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But I need to know. I need to know that I'm not crazy or something. At least not crazier than my therapist says. And you're good at this stuff. You could help me. Worst case scenario, it was all a waste of time, but at least we tried. Best case scenario, we know and prove who really did it. I wish I could tell you that we came to an airtight conclusion, but I can't. 
There are so many unanswered questions when it comes to the accident that killed Flance's father because it was never investigated as a crime by the York police. We don't have much in the way of physical evidence because nothing was collected. The scene wasn't secured, and anything that might have proved it was no accident is long gone. It's all speculation, but we've tried to weave the pieces together to present our best understanding of what may have happened and how much Mac was involved in the outcome. There will be certain things we can't, in good conscience, include in our theories. Theories about people who may have been involved in some way are left out of this podcast for ethical reasons. I don't feel good about naming people without concrete proof, and I just don't have concrete proof. So, uh... What happened after the accident? I was adopted by my dad's cousins, Malcolm and Desmond. They were good to me, but we weren't close like I was with my dad. Don't get me wrong, I totally appreciate everything they've done for me. They took me in, fed me, clothed me, understood me to a certain extent. You're all grieving, you know? Maybe not explicitly, but like implicitly. Except for Mac. Mac seemed distant, but not in. Like the way a grieving person would be distant. What do you mean by that? Like, how could you tell that he wasn't grieving? Because people grieve in different ways, and I'm not trying to, like, invalidate your observations. I'm just curious. He wasn't isolating out of, like, grief or anything. He wasn't mourning. He was just cold and distant, like, emotionally. He seemed like he was hiding something, I mean, which makes me think that there's no way he didn't do it. Now, I just want to remind everyone that there's no correct way to grieve after the death of a loved one. It is pure speculation to claim someone is a murderer simply because they don't react in the way you expect or want after a death. Flyance is using his own instinct to gut feelings. That's not to say that instincts can't be correct. It's just important to remember it can be dangerous and damning to criminalize certain manifestations of grief. But even though he was so young and memories can be tricky, it has stayed with him through all of these years just how off Mac was after Benguo's death. Malcolm and Desmond declined to be part of this podcast, but sent this statement. We stand behind Flayance in a strong belief that Mackenzie Stewart is in some way responsible for the death of his father and our cousin Benguo. We personally do not have an opinion on Benguo's death, but we fully support Flayance in his quest to learn the truth of what happened that August day. After the accident, we allowed Flayance's godparents to visit him at our home, but it was clear after a few visits that it was not healthy for Flayance to be around Mackenzie, and it seemed to disturb Mackenzie to be around his godson as well. At this time, we have no other comments. And he visited us, me and my dad's cousins afterward. He was my godfather. What are they supposed to do? Deny him of seeing his godchild? Who would do that? Plus, I knew Mac and Beth. My dad's cousins, they wanted no enemies, even if it meant having someone sketchy associated with them, which Mac was. He was the walking definition of suspicious. He was sketchy, like yeah, really sorry sketchy. sorry to interrupt. I just need a little bit of clarification. What do you mean by sketchy? Could you maybe talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. After his death, Mac couldn't look me in the eyes, like, at all. He'd catch a glance and just get really uncomfortable and awkward. He was sketchy in that way. Maybe a little paranoid, probably? Actually, I think paranoid would be a good word for it. He seemed anxious that he'd get caught with something. I don't remember him being comfortable around me after Dad died. I've always been told that I'm basically a spitting image of my dad. It makes me feel good, though, that he did that. It's like I am... I'm a walking representative of his guilt, of his sins of his failure, and I literally cannot explain how satisfied I am with that. At the time, I felt at blame for his unease. I thought he couldn't look me in the eye because I took away his best friend. Now I know that he was the one to blame. Mac killed him, regardless of what the justice system has to say. Was Bangbo's death the gruesome conclusion to foul play or a devastating accident? Was it his best friend who sabotaged the car? Or was it a simple maintenance issue gone horribly wrong? I hope you will join us as we explore the deaths of Beth and Banquo on this season of Shakespeareal. On the next episode of Shakespeareal. I just don't get it. There's nothing that ties me to Beth's death at all. No one will believe me that she intentionally did this to herself. They just keep bringing up Banquo in the letter. See, even Mac understands the significance of the letter and the role it played in his arrest for the murder of his wife. He did deny the contents of the letter when it was first published, but he never denies it during the trial for Beth's murder. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that's left out. Our theory is that he's guilty of the accusations in the letter, and his lawyer told him to just shut up about it in case the prosecution decided to formally open up an investigation into the accident. That proof fell away. How a group of true crime enthusiasts put the pressure on the prosecution to try Mac for the death of his wife after turning up circumstantial evidence about the car accident that killed his best friend. 
Until next time. Shakespeareal is brought to you by MAST Radio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thanks to our sponsor, the Living Shakespeare Society, and our producer, Bill Shakes. Remember, this podcast is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. See you next week.